Quite an invitation. Um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. And thank you very much for the kind invitation to be here. So for me, the most important aspect of the genetic origin of thoracic aortic disease is that every person who presents either with a dissection or a known aneurysm could be the early warning sign for other family members that could actually be the thing that could potentially save a life if we can start screening and perhaps initiate prophylactic medical therapy or, of course, surgical therapy. So our story starts with exactly that situation. And we had a 33-year-old man who presented with a type A dissection on the background of a dilated aorta. And he told us that his father had presented to our unit in the same situation three years earlier. So this was a missed opportunity, and that's why I'm standing here today. So we know that... Um, thoracic aortic disease is familial in at least 20%. And I think it is at least 20% and probably a lot more than that. The reason for it being probably more than that is that it's usually asymptomatic disease. So if we're taking a family history, asking people if they've had problems, there could be a lot of as yet unknown genes or as yet unscreened aneurysms. Genetic testing can potentially play a part in that role to try and allow for tailored surveillance for our patients. It doesn't ever take away from clinical screening because if the gene is positive, then that can be helpful, but there are many, many more genes for us to learn and understand, and if gene testing is negative or non-informative, that patient still needs follow-up, even if their aortic route is normal, because it may increase at a later stage of that patient's life. It would appear that the incidence of aneurysmal and dissection disease is increasing. I think this is probably more that we are finding it rather than it's actually increasing because we are doing more CT scans, investigating other things such as query PE. And these are where a lot of my patients come from. This graph suggests that we're getting more aneurysmal disease rather than more dissection disease, which I fits with that. I think there's probably also more family screening going on, and hence we're finding more of these cases. So the genetics of thoracic aortic disease first came to be published back in 1997. And there had been a little bit of a delay in realizing that it was um, hereditary, secondary to abdominal aortic disease, which was known to be hereditary sooner, partly because it was felt that dilating aneurysmal disease and dissecting aneurysmal disease were felt to be separate, but they were found in the same families. It was also noted in the early studies that hypertension alone couldn't account for the degree of disease. So if we think of the 20% being familial, we think often about the 5% that are syndromic, and I will, of course, talk about those, but 15% of them are non-syndromic, and it's harder to detect those patients because they may not be obvious. So of the syndromic thoracic aortic diseases, I'm going to cover three of them. Marfan syndrome is the most common syndromic disease. Lois Dietz is less common and potentially more aggressive. And the rarest and most malignant is vascular Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. So Marfan syndrome is characterized by extremities being disproportionately long compared to the patient's height, such as long fingers and long arm span. There are also other skeletal abnormalities, such as pectus carinatum, pectus excavatum. Patients have a dilated aortic root, which can be really useful for screening because it usually shows up quite easy on an echocardiogram. They also have ectopia lentus. So in making the diagnosis of Marfan syndrome, we're looking for a dilated aorta plus ectopia lentus because that's really very specific for Marfan syndrome. If they have those features plus family history, again, very specific. If they have those features plus a fibrillin-1 gene variant, very specific. Often we won't have that obvious diagnosis, and so that's when the systemic feature score comes in. This is a score that takes into account the height and the arm span, the thumb and the wrist sign, the typical facial features that we get from Marfan syndrome. So if a patient doesn't quite meet the diagnostic criteria for Marfan syndrome, we could label them as a non-specific connective tissue disorder until either genetic information becomes available or until their aorta dilates and they trigger Marfan diagnosis. So Lois Dietz syndrome is a triad of hypertelorism, this widely spaced eyes, which is seen in 90% of patients with typical Lois Dietz syndrome. 
About 30% of patients with low eats have a bifid uvula, and most of them have very tortuous vascular tree with widespread vascular aneurysms. When things come to light, so low eats was first described in 2005, and when these conditions first come to light, it's usually the most obvious ones that are found. We know that there is a correlation between the clinical phenotype and the risk of dissection. So when these patients were first described, it was felt that this was an extremely aggressive disease with dissections at very low levels. More recent publications would suggest that it's perhaps not as aggressive as initially found because we're finding more and more of the genes associated with Lowy's Dietz with lesser phenotypical features and hence lower risk of dissection. Vascular Ehlers-Danlos syndrome is the rarest and most malignant. It's characterized by thin, fragile tissues. You can see the veins through patient's skin, often because they have very little connective tissue underneath the skin. They have easy bruising. They may present with uterine or intestinal rupture, as well as vascular complications. Most of the syndromes, be they syndromic or non-syndromic, but most of the genes associated with thoracic disease are of autosomal dominant inheritance. So this is a picture of the family who have Lowy's Dietz syndrome with a TGF beta receptor 2 variant. Females are shown as a circle, males are squared. If it's <coughs> colored in, the patient has the gene or the disease and a line through it means the patient has died. So when we're taking family pedigrees, it's important to go back through at least three generations. And we must be asking about known aneurysms or dissections, luckily quite unusual words. So patients would tend to remember those words and if, if, even if they're not sure, they think they've heard something similar. But we also need to be looking for patients who've had sudden cardiac death because 84% of sudden cardiac death in patients with these connective tissue diseases is due to type A dissection leading to tamponade. So if a patient's had a sudden cardiac death, it will often have been attributed to a sudden heart attack, and that may not be true at all. So we need to be trying to chase up post-mortems and make sure we've got the right diagnosis. There's a lot of clinical variability with these genes. Most of the ones which can cause syndromes that we know about, we also know can also cause non-syndromic disease. To complicate matters further, there are variable degrees of penetrance and expressivity, even within the same gene in the same family. And then there's a clinical spectrum of the various disease that it can, it can bring. We're learning much, much more about these genes, and we're very much still at the infancy of it. The dictionary of these pathogenic variants is growing, and we're finding out more and more literally day by day. One of the problems of something like this is the, the negatives, the frequent variants of uncertain significance, because these don't either confirm disease or refute the disease, and it can leave quite a lot of anxiety and uncertainty for our patients. To try and make this easier to understand, this was a recent publication from the ClinGen Aortopathy Working Group where they took 53 genes thought to cause problems with the aorta and they tried to define them into definitive and strong genes known to be associated with aortic disease and likely to be pathogenic. So the genes associated with these conditions code for proteins. The proteins are involved either in the collagen or the elastin or the smooth muscle fibers that make up the aorta, and that's how they lead to weakness of the aorta. So when would we recommend considering genetic testing? Well, clearly, if there's more than one family member with disease, either when you first take that family pedigree or later if something comes to light from perhaps a post-mortem information that comes from available or when you're doing family screening, you find another family member has an asymptomatic dilated aorta. Thoracic aortic disease of onset at a younger age. So what defines younger age? It may be younger than expected. So perhaps somebody who presents at an older age of the spectrum, but with no other risk factors at all and with no hypertension. We would use 60 as our cutoff for considering it, but there is certainly some leniency there if there's something that doesn't seem to hang together. Certainly patients with syndromic features should be considered for genetic testing. So if a patient has ectopia lentis, we would go straight for an FBN1 analysis because if you're looking for Marfan syndrome and there's strong clinical suspicion, the chances of that gene being positive is high, 90 to 95%. If there aren't these specific features, we would want to cover an aortopathy panel, usually using those 11 genes out of the 53 that we know to be either strong or definitive. 
So what do we do with the information? Well, there is some information that there can be gene-specific recommendations. An ACTA2 mutation has been associated, as of many of these disorders, unfortunately, with dissection at a lower aortic size than is recommended in the guidelines for surgery. And that, that was discussed in the earlier session this afternoon. But it, there is a publication to suggest that we should think about surgical repair at 4.5 centimeters. On the other hand, a fibrillin-1 mutation with Marfan syndrome can generally be monitored to 5 centimeters unless there's a family history of dissection at smaller diameters or there's rapid enlargement or there's significant aortic regurgitation or there's uncontrolled hypertension, something else that makes you worry. The Lois Dietz syndrome, although more publications suggesting some of them can be lower risk, we should still consider surgical management in a more aggressive man manner than, say, Marfan syndrome. This is just trying to show some information of the sort of publications that are coming out. These aren't definitive enough to make guideline recommendations, but as more and more information and publications come out, we should be able to use this data to counsel our patients as to their risks versus the risks of surgery, and it will also be able to help medical management and simple decisions like does our patient take part in contact sport and advice about weightlifting, things like that. Also, having a gene means that we can have research targeted to the specific disease. So there was a recent publication last year looking at low sartan and atenolol in Marfan <coughs> syndrome. We expected that the low sartan arm would do significantly better than the atenolol arm, and that wasn't the case. We also have data on use of soliprolol in vascular Ehlers-Danlos. And so if we know the gene, it can be helpful to pick which beta blocker we want to try and prevent progression of the aortic size. Simple differential diagnosis can be helpful. So we've said there's a lot of crossover in the clinical phenotypes for different genetic diseases. So if we take Lois Dietz syndrome and vascular Ehlers-Danlos, it can be difficult to tell from the end of the bed which spectrum we're looking at. And I know we wouldn't want to be finding out that a patient has vascular Ehlers-Danlos syndrome when we're about to try and do a prophylactic root replacement. If we know there's a genetic abnormality causing the connective tissue disease, we can use that to gather more information in trying to risk stratify when we should interact for our patient. So this is looking at vertebral artery tortuosity. It can be measured easily simply by an MRA scan, and it does predict poor outcomes. Essentially what we're looking at is the connective tissue is diseased. As it's diseased, it becomes weaker. If it's weakened and under stress, such as from hypertension, then it tries to lengthen. It can't lengthen because it's within a fixed space, and so it coils instead. The more coiling there is, the more stress that artery is under, and that seems to be a marker for dissection. So we can measure that and use it in our risk stratification of when somebody ought to undergo surgery. So to conclude, and this is my final slide to summarize, I believe that every patient presenting with aneurysm or dissection could be the early warning that another family member is at risk. And I would suggest that many, if not probably most, but I don't think we have all the data yet, of these thoracic aortic diseases are familial. So please consider family screening, and I have to say, even if a patient has died. So we would always be very happy to take a referral to initiate that family screening, even after the patient and their family have left the hospital. Genetic testing can be helpful, and it's certainly an incredibly interesting area of research, but genetic testing can also be negative, and at this stage, that can never mean that the patient doesn't have disease, and clinical and image-based surveillance is vital throughout the life of the patient and their family. Thank you very much for your time and attention.